In this segment, we're going to take a look at the state government and budgets and taxes, uh, what state governments spend their money on, and how they get their revenue. So there are two types of budgets for states. And you oftentimes hear at the federal level uh, that there is one budget and you can run a deficit as much as you want. For states, there's an operating budget and that has to be balanced every year. Uh, unlike the federal government, uh, there are constitutional provisions that force them to balance their budgets year in, year out. So during times of economic distress, they're left with either cutting services or increasing taxes in order to be able to balance their budget. There is a second type of budget though called a capital budget, uh, which is essentially for projects that are ongoing within a state. Uh, we in Pennsylvania had something called Growing Greener a couple years ago where we decided to borrow some money in order to be able to um, have some, uh, preserve some open space that was an ongoing project and that's over a number of years, so you're allowed to be able to run a deficit on that. Now, let's take a look at some uh, facets of what we see in relationship to how, um, how, how we get money for government. Uh, this is from the National Association of State Budget Officers. They do uh, twice annual reports on the state and the health of, of state governments. Uh, some longitudinal data here uh, and they're the total state expenditures by funding source. So what you see is about a third of the entire state government budget comes from federal money, uh, which are what we would call pass-throughs. And this money goes from the federal government to the states and back out to certain areas of policy where there are federal priorities. Uh, we'll see in a couple minutes for the, for the states, the biggest thing that we see here uh, is in relationship to Medicaid. 40% comes from the general fund, which we'll see is uh, partially from income taxes or sales taxes. 2% uh, is from bonds, in other words, they're borrowing uh, against future profits. And then there are other state funds that we'll talk about as we go through this section. So one thing to be cognizant of is the idea that there's a difference between own source revenue and all funds. So the table on the left shows expenditures by function for states, including both federal government money as well as their own source revenue. And what you'll see is that Medicaid comes in as the largest single program for state governments, coming in at 28.2%. Now, one of the interesting things is we'll see here looking at the charts, a substantial amount of that money for Medicaid comes in from the federal government and it's not from their own expenditures. I'd like to highlight here though, that if you talk about education in some total, adding up elementary and secondary education as well as higher education, that gets you to 29.6%, which is actually more than Medicaid. So in some total education and expenditures for ed education actually uh, are a larger source of expenditures for states than Medicaid. Now, looking at the chart on the right-hand side, uh, at the top, you'll see that these are the sources of revenues that come from the federal government and what they're spent on. So the largest single program that the federal government funds on behalf of the states and passes through is Medicaid. So well over half of the funds at 56.1% of the funds that the states get from the federal government go directly towards Medicaid. So that's a, a, a big source. The federal government doesn't have a, a real big role in education, funding less than 13% uh, than, than, uh, here at about 12.6%. Uh, transportation's a big source and public assistance as well, and then other things. What's interesting to note is the chart on the bottom right-hand corner, which is general fund expenditures from own source revenue. So again, here we see that education takes the priority. So elementary and secondary ed account for over a third of the expenditures uh, for uh, the, the state governments at 35.2% of their budgets. And again, if we were to add higher education in there, you would see that 
uh, we basically have about 45% of a state budget goes towards higher uh, education of some sort. And Medicaid then comes in as these, again, as the second uh, most important expenditure. Uh, again, while most of the money comes uh, from Medicaid comes from the federal government, you'll see that a substantial portion of a state general fund expenditures come uh, from uh, for, for Medicaid at close to 20%. Now, there are a couple of constraints on state government spending that we can take a look at. One is obviously the economy. I mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that you have to have a balanced budget. States in general uh, find very difficult times during economic downturns because their kind of spending is counter cyclical in that they need to spend more money providing services to people when the economy is down. Uh, and at the same time, there are more unemployed people, so there's less income tax and there are less people buying things, so there's less sales taxes when the economy's down. So spending goes up, revenue goes down, and that makes it very difficult for states to be able to uh, balance their budgets. Generally, when times are good, uh, sales taxes will go up because people were buying more stuff and then income taxes will go up revenues will go up as well because more people are employed in general that's the time when we get new programs from state governments uh, or else some sort of tax cuts federal aid is important as well as we saw you know particularly in a program like Medicaid uh, the share of federal aid has, has gone down since the 1960s uh, and state governments have really kind of adjusted to what's been called the new normal with less funding from the federal government, but that's taken some time to be able to adjust to that. Population shifts are also important. Uh, if you take a look at different types of states around the country, Pennsylvania Falls and kind of what we call the Rust Belt area, uh, where we have um, you know, less economic growth, less people moving into the area. We tend to have a higher proportion of older people, higher proportion of uneducated people, undereducated people. And you compare that, say, for example, with the South uh, or the coasts uh, on the West Coast where more people are moving, these population shifts have a profound effect on what government has to spend its money on. So we're focused here in Pennsylvania particularly on spending money on services for older people in the state. And that kind of comes into conflict with things like education funding. If you take a look at those fast growing areas of the South, they're more interested in building, say for example, new schools and new infrastructure, and that affects what government has to spend money on. And finally, one of the things we can also think about is the economic base. What is there that we can actually tax? And the most efficient form of taxation is trying to shift the tax burden away from residents of a state onto people that visit them or onto other companies that extract types of resources. So for example, in Nevada, gambling and tourists uh, are a large source of revenue and they're focused on kind of extracting money from these people as they visit. Alaska, on the other hand, has a large amount of natural resources and as a consequence of that, uh, they tax national natural resource extraction, and what we'll see in a couple minutes is actually that the, the people that live in Alaska get some money back every year because of the fact that, uh, that, that they have these natural resource taxes. How about taxes by category? Where do we get the money from at the state level? Uh, looking at this, what we see is that the individual income tax is the most important source of revenue for states, generating a little bit over a third of their tax collections. Mentioned earlier that historically, the state uh, tax, states have relied pretty heavily on the sales taxes, and uh, certainly they still do. If you combine selective sales taxes and general sales taxes, uh, that's the largest source of revenue for state governments. Uh, but, uh, you know, but again, individual income taxes are, are the largest source uh, individually. If we take a look at the state income taxes, in 2015, we saw that 41 states have state income taxes. Uh, you have two basic types of income taxes at the state level. 
One is a flat rate where there's only one rate for everybody within the state. And a second is a more progressive graduated income tax like we have at the federal level. So for example, in Pennsylvania, the property, I mean, excuse me, the income tax is 3.07% of our income. Uh, interestingly, it does not include retirement income, just income uh, from your job and your work and your current work. And there was only one tax bracket. And that's basically set up uh, as a consequence of our Pennsylvania state constitution not allowing for pre uh, progressive taxation. On the other hand, if we move across to our neighbor, across the uh, Delaware River, New Jersey has six income tax brackets ranging from 1.4% up to 8.97%. And um, those people that are in that 8.97% tax bracket uh, are people that earn more than uh, $499,999. In other words, if you make a half a million dollars or more, you're gonna pay the highest amount of taxes in New Jersey. Uh, California has the highest marginal tax rate of any of the states. They have 10 brackets and their highest rate for people that earn more than $1 million is 13.3% of their income. When it comes to state sales taxes, 45 states have state, state sales taxes. Uh, we're well aware of our neighbor to the south, Delaware, that does not have sales taxes. Um, 38 states allow local sales taxes as well. Now, there are two ways to take a look at sales taxes. One is what we can call a general sales tax, which is the same across the board for all types of different products. So for example, you know, we have a 6% sales tax here in Pennsylvania, uh, and that applies to things like when you buy cars or when you buy a new boat or uh, when you buy uh, you know, computers, whatever the case may be. In most states, we generally exempt things that are considered to be essential food items. Um, now, what this means can be different in the states. So for example, in Pennsylvania, you run into problems. If you buy a prepared food, uh, say from Giant, that can be considered to be a taxable food item, non-essential. But you could buy the same exact piece of chicken uncooked, and that would not have a sales tax on it because it's not prepared food. So it's a very complicated system here and, and there's a lot of discretion as to how things are taxed. Uh, in addition, nonprofits are usually exempt from having to pay sales taxes uh, on the things that they purchase. Other than general sales taxes, we also have what we can call the selective sales taxes, which are focused on targeting specific services or commodities uh, where the states can raise more revenue or where they want you to stop using that product. So let's take a look at the state sales tax rates. Um, it, California has the highest state sales tax at 7.5%, Jersey's at 7%, Pennsylvania at 6 and the state with the lowest state sales tax rate that actually has a sales tax is Colorado at 2.9%. Uh, and then again, there are five states that have no sales tax. We also have a corporate income tax. Uh, Pennsylvania's got one of the highest in the country uh, at 9.9% uh, of the taxation uh, on company incomes. And just step back for a second. We talked a little bit about the selective sales taxes. Here are some of those that are more important to the state of Pennsylvania. So for example, uh, we have total revenues of $34.2 billion in 2014 for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the biggest selective sales taxes was motor fuels taxes, where $2.3 billion, uh, or about seven or eight percent of the total revenues for the state come from that. Taxes on utilities are big, insurance premiums, alcohol and tobacco are also major sources of revenue for the state of Pennsylvania. In total, fuel taxes are a really big source of income. Uh, in 2010, they amounted to $35.4 billion uh, collected by the states, and that amounts to about a third of a percentage of our personal income here. Um, gasoline taxes uh, range uh, from um, eight uh, cents a gallon in Alaska up to Pennsylvania, which has the highest uh, gasoline tax at 50.5% uh, 50.5 cents a gallon. So if you add that on to the US federal tax, 
we're looking at the fact that we're paying close to 70 cents a gallon in taxes here in the state of Pennsylvania. Now, there are other things that we have called sin taxes. And the aim of a sin tax is basically to prevent us from engaging in certain types of behavior, things that are considered to be undesirable behavior by the government. So it's kind of a killing two birds with one stone aspect. A, you're raising revenue, and B, you're trying to discourage certain types of behavior. Uh, so there are taxes on liquor, taxes on beer, taxes on cigarettes, et cetera. And if you live in Philadelphia, you know that there's a tax on your sugary beverage. So here's an example in the U.S. when it comes to cigarette taxes, there's an average of $1.36 uh, a pack of cigarette taxes. Uh, Pennsylvania is right around the national average, but New Jersey is higher in New York. So in the state of New York, uh, you will pay $4.35 a pack in cigarette taxes. Uh, there are some states that have lower cigarette taxes. Uh, some of those are traditionally those states that grow tobacco. We have alcohol taxes as well. Um, Four dollars, close to four dollars a gallon on liquor. Uh, national average about seventy-five cents a gallon on wine, and about twenty-five cents a gallon on beer. Pennsylvania, we also get some uh, revenue from our casinos. So you'll see that uh, fifty-five percent of the the revenue from slot machines goes to the states, and fourteen percent of the revenue from table games go to the state, uh, and most of that goes, uh, to most of the, the money uh, that we get from that goes to the Pennsylvania General Fund uh, and then to local governments as well. Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, property tax relief is the biggest source of expenditures in relationship to casino revenue uh, and then economic and development funds uh, and local governments get 4% uh, of that just for their general funds. And then the horse race industry gets a little money itself. Other things that we have are something called user fees. And this is the idea that if you use a service within society that not everybody uses, then you should be the one that's taxed for using that. And in general, we earmark part of the fee, that's the user fee, for, for the provision of those services. So. Take a look at the picture down here on the right hand side. Uh, you know, come April, uh, when trout season comes around, all over the state, uh, the state game commission releases trout into the water. And then we yeah, have the first day of trout season and they're all fished out by the end of the day. Well, the idea behind this is you pay money for your fishing license and pay money for a trout stamp on that fishing license and since not everybody fishes, that money is then used to help stock the rivers and streams here in Pennsylvania with trout, right? So the idea that we have to pay a license to use that is the idea that if you're using a service, you should be the one that pay for, pays for it, not all of society. Uh, additionally, car registration fees are the same. If you drive a car, uh, you have to pay uh, a fee for that, and that, that goes towards the Department of Transportation. Uh, here you see, again, kind of a breakdown of revenues from licenses. Motor vehicle license brings in almost a billion dollars a year. Uh, hunting and fishing, about 74 million. Uh, and our actual uh, licensing fees for getting um, driver's licenses bring in about $50 million. We do have some other taxes. The lottery, for example, in Pennsylvania is designed to go towards older Pennsylvanians help them out with property tax relief and prescription drugs and mass transit. Um, so, uh, you know, since 1972, we've taken in about $24 billion and uh, about a billion dollars a year goes to older Pennsylvanians. It varies by state as to whether or not you're going to use that money uh, for things like older people. In some states, the lotteries were founded in order to be able to spend extra money on education. We decided to devote it here in Pennsylvania to older Pennsylvanians. And on the right hand side here, you see that uh, what, where the money goes in Delaware County, for example. So uh, basically $47 million came back to uh, beneficiaries in Delaware County where Widener is uh, in the 2013-14 year. And you can see where that money goes for. Other taxes, 
Um, we have what's called a severance tax. So Alaska, for example, has a lot of oil, natural gas, timber, minerals, and so forth. And um, basically, Alaska has been a very forward-looking state in that it realizes at some point it may run out of natural resources such as oil and natural gas. So they've developed something called the Permanent Fund. And the idea behind the Permanent Fund is that you save money uh, from, from the resources that have been extracted right now, and this money will then go uh, towards a, a future kind of a fund that will help fund state government. So right now, uh, you can see that over the course of the last 40 or so years, the state government of, Cal uh, of, 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 um, of, of Alaska has accrued a $62 billion um, state permanent fund that will help them in the future when they run potentially out of uh, natural, uh, natural gas and oil. And if you happen to be a citizen of the state of Alaska, you got $900 back uh, in the form of uh, a rebate as a consequence of this. Now, we have a substantial amount of natural gas in the Marcellus Shale that runs through the state of Pennsylvania. We do not currently have a severance tax. We have what's called an impact fee of 2%, which goes towards local governments to help them deal with the impact of having natural gas drilling within uh, their areas. As you can see here, the rise of hydraulic fracturing in the United States over the last decade or so has really led to a vast increase in the amount of severance taxes or those taxes that we impose on business for taking natural resources out of our soil. Um, this has been a great bone of contention in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, in general, uh, Democrats have supported uh, taking uh, you know, having a, a around a 5% severance tax on natural gas. Uh, Republicans in general have opposed this. Um, and uh, we are somewhat at a, at a loggerheads of being able to use these severance taxes. So these are overall the types of, uh, of taxes that we have. And, um, and that's the end for the uh, state, state taxes.